I wanted to thank Sandbox, first of all, this great location designed by Jerry Lomax. And the owner, uh, Mark Talbot, and Michelle Jokichu, and they put on fantastic performances, musical performances, and other things here. Um, and go to their website, sandboxsandcity.com. Uh, they really do great things. Um, I want to thank the AIA Monterey Bay board members and members of the Arts and Archite Architecture Lecture Committee, our executive director, Shermaine Jones. And tonight I wanted to especially thank uh, Jeannie Marino. Jeannie, thank you for helping when... <laughs> I also want to thank uh, the Osborne family for providing the housing for our housing lecture series for tonight. So, Polly, thank you. Um, I want to especially thank uh, a sponsor for tonight, Dan Silveri, uh, who, from Silveri Properties and Silicon Constructors, for sponsoring tonight's event. Please give them some appreciation. And I definitely wanted to let everyone know if you missed the first two, or one of the first, of the first two series of lectures we did, um, you can go to AIAMontereyBay.org and links to the Arts and Architecture architecture lecture series to see those videos of those, uh, those two great presentations. One was Liam Dillon of the LA Times and the Gimme Shelter podcast, who gave us a great overview of the housing crisis and new policies and laws being used to combat it. Um, our last talk was with Daniel Simons and Padram Parishbandi of David Baker Architects, and they discussed the firm's large body of work in the Bay Area and beyond, and their principles outlined in their book nine ways to make housing for people. Um, before I discuss tonight's presentation, I wanted to encourage everyone here to mark Thursday, May 18th in your calendars, same time, same place here at Sandbox. And this will be our final event of the series, which will be a panel discussion and community forum, really digging deep into the issues and possible solutions and ways for getting into more, or getting more quality housing built on the Central Coast. Um, Supervisor Mary Adams will give an introduction. We'll have a panel including Sibley Simon from the Housing Design, Build, and Development Company Workbench in Santa Cruz. Planning Director um, Kim Cole, who's here tonight, will be on the panel from the City of Monterey. Roxanne Wilson, Head of Homelessness Services for Monterey County, will be here. Catherine Avila, who's also here tonight, will be from Avila Construction, will be on the panel. Mike DeLapa of Land Watch Monterey County. And we'll also have a large group of additional participants uh, who include more nonprofit and for-profit developers, builders, political leaders, and housing advocates. Uh, so definitely be a lot of knowledgeable people and stakeholders from our area. It should be very lively discussion and we hope to end with uh, productive um, ways to move things forward here in our area. So please register at our website, aiamontereybay.org, and the Arts and Architecture Lecture Series link. Um, so now for this evening, we continue focusing not just on the need for more housing and producing those units to meet the arena numbers you've heard so much about, but on how good design, great design, matters and makes a difference in creating the homes and buildings to produce better neighborhoods, communities, and cities. When we, we began uh, discussing the lecture series, uh, our committee, on when we were talking about housing, and ma we made a list of possible speakers we can get, and there was one firm which was at the top of certainly my list, but I really actually didn't imagine we could get them. I mean, Angie Brooks and Larry Scarpa had just won the AIA National Gold Medal, the highest architectural award in the country, and this award, I should, just to be clear, this is not just given to Americans, but it's given to people like Renzo Piano, Richard Rogers, Tadao Ando. It's basically given to the greatest architects in the world. So when we brought up their name in the committee, it was, of course, our president, Polly Osborne, who said, oh, I, I met Larry like 20 years ago. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. <laughs> I'll reach out to him. So, Polly, you made this happen. <laughs> Um, and the reason why I was so excited about having Angie and Larry here is not only because they're amazing, amazing world-class architects designing and having built really exceptional buildings, but because they are really, for want of a better word, tremendous citizen architects. 
especially when it comes to affordable housing. They have been anything but passive in addressing all the issues and problems that they, had, they found with their different projects. They've founded organizations like Livable Places Incorporated, a development and public policy organization dedicated to producing more sustainable and livable communities, and things like the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute, which helps other projects, projects developers and architects produce simply better projects. They received a $4.5 million housing innovation grant from the Los Angeles County for scalable solutions to the homeless crisis. They engage in, uh, with the communities in which they work to really make a difference to produce more equitable, sustainable, better designed homes, buildings, neighborhoods, and cities. They have won really too many awards to mention, but beyond the gold medal, they have received the California State and AIA National Firm Award, six Coat Top Green Awards. I think it's more than 100 significant national and international design awards for different projects. Angie was the first woman to win the Maybeck Award, which is the highest award given to a California architect. I could go on, but let it be said, we're very honored tonight to present Angela Brooks and Lawrence Scarpa to our audience, and I think we'll learn a lot. Thank you. Is it is nearly 100% independent from the power grid. It was built by an architect who specializes in... A new building that is energy conscious is now going up in Santa Monica, and it's getting a lot of attention. Channel 4's Patrick Healy is there. In Santa At first, it appears to be any new apartment project, just another building noisily being put up on a Santa Monica corner lot. But Colorado Court is in the... One of Leo's personal uh, passions is finding out ways to provide environmentally safe housing to low-income families. Take a look. We're standing here at the first green affordable housing project in the country. This is Larry Scarpa, the architect. Why don't you... You get the idea. <laughs> it was nuts. You know, we were just doing what my mother would describe as Jewish common sense. You know, it was like poor people need it the most. They need good design. They need energy efficiency. And... It just made sense to us. We didn't think we were doing anything special. Um, and this was the first LEED certified project in the country. And it was affordable housing, and it was really a game changer in the state. When we finished this, the state completely changed how they score affordable housing projects. And if you look today, what we did back then 23 years ago when people were telling us, there's architects, there's no way you can do this. We try it all the time. It gets value engineered out. And then when we did it, they were the first ones to ask, how did you do it? You know, and so, you know, we consider ourselves, um, we're not wild cowboys, but we like to say calculated risk takers. And so, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. As Steve Jobs said, you'll probably regret more what you don't do than what you do do. And so we're always looking for ways to make real change. Um, this project is, you know, again, we, we try not to really invent anything. A lot of designers look far reaching for some new world. We try to look right in front of our face, like this building was modeled after many buildings, you would see like that plan up there on the left, the courtyard building, where it has lots of natural light, uh, cross ventilation, it's oriented properly. You know, I like to say, uh, who out there hates natural light? Anyone hate natural, anyone hate cross ventilation? You know, it's like you just do simple things and it's, and it's a winner. So, and then we just added solar panels on, so this building became a really highly efficient building. Um, and, you know, despite, we got every award on the planet for this building. And uh, even so, when we were done, we felt a bit of emptiness. So, if you look at that ground floor on our project on the right, <clears throat> this is downtown Santa Monica. It is prime commercial real estate. 
and the best we could do to convince our client was put a community room there. So we thought to ourselves, is our building really any better than those buildings you see on the left where they don't contribute to the community? You know, and so um, as soon as we finished that, we said, this is crazy. We have to do something. So we gathered a bunch of friends, bankers, architects, landscape architects, planners, a whole array of people, developers, both nonprofit and for profit, and we started meeting at our office every the first Saturday of every month to talk about things like what should we do. So uh, we did all kinds of things. What's interesting, you see the sketches up there on the left that Roger Sherman did. This was talking about densifying the single family zone, and we were told, you know, by politicians. Political suicide, don't even go there. Okay, what's happening today, you know, 25 years later? So, um, so we, after a while, we said we should try and start to do something. So we formulated ideas, and really what we were doing was trying to help what we call the working poor, teachers, firefighters, uh, hotel workers. We need them. It's proven that diverse communities are richer and function better. And there are people, working people, who can't afford to be housed. And so um, we wound up writing some grants. And basically, overnight, we got a couple million dollars in grants, this group of folks, to do something about it. And we started, at that point, this nonprofit called Livable Places. And the idea was to do more sustainable, affordable communities um, for working people. And I have to say, our logo, which is that red dot in the circle around it, is the exact um, pathway a person blindfolded follows when they are trying to find a tree. You put the person blindfolded near the tree, and this is the pathway that they take, and they're blindfolded. So that's kind of what we thought when we were starting this nonprofit. We didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> and we ran a lot like that. <laughs> so we, the first thing we did was we bought this building in Lincoln Heights, which is just north of downtown LA. We paid, it's 100,000 square feet. We paid $3 million for it. And before we did anything, people were offering us eight to 10 million bucks for this thing. And it was empty, no one was using it. There were some people on the ground floor, but that's it, it was underutilized. So we were committed to developing it. So it's right, if you look in the foreground, this is the original prison, LA prison. And this is Lincoln Heights. And what we propose to do market rate housing on top, extraordinary views of downtown, affordable housing in the middle, and live work on the ground. OK, it almost killed us to get this project done. It took 26 or 27 variances. In a year, a year. To do it, which today, all of those things now you can do by right because we basically did it. And again, we went, if you look at the transit in the foreground, we would identify sites close to transit, underserved communities to build these projects which would become catalysts to help revitalize the neighborhoods. Well, this one was so successful it priced us out of our own neighborhood, you know? And so it was, for us, we had mixed feelings because we could no longer afford to do our projects there, but it had, the, the wheels had gone in motion, you know? And like any good developer will tell you, never be the first, be the second. Well, we were always the first, and then what would happen is developers would follow us around, and wherever we would acquire a property, they'd buy right behind us. <laughs> Um, so this is, go ahead. But it was successful because Ed Reyes at the time was the council member who represented this area, and he wanted this to be a mixed-use node, but it was industrially zoned for almost the entire neighborhood, so it was illegal to build housing here. So he wanted us to do this project and go through all these variances to show other people how to do it, other developers. So you can see our project there on the right, and... Uh, what's happened to this neighborhood now. That project's almost done by Patrick Ty. You can see our building right across the street there. This neighborhood's being transformed. And it doesn't take a lot. This, the council 
about a year ago just signed off on this proposal to redevelop the jail across the street. So this is going to happen. There's housing going up. So our buildings become kind of the catalyst for really transforming the neighbor neighborhood. So that's what that's going to look like. So, you know, with all the good sides, there's always downside. Um, we wanted this to remain affordable. And, you know, for us, this, we always had these discussions with our group. How do we do it? And we landed on this, you know, where we would target people that were low income, but we put no restrictions on them. And so they started selling their things. And this is from several years ago. This you know, thing I just clipped off the internet, the units at 500,000, they're now almost a million. So All the units were for sale, so you could buy a unit and Buy and it and sell, sell it. it. So doing it different, we would probably do something different. Uh, you know, how we would put income restricted or deed restricted, but you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. There are now community land trusts, and that's a whole nother discussion, that will preserve the affordability because the land is owned by the, the nonprofit entity. So part of what we wanted to do as a group was we wanted to, one, show what could be done by example through development and use the developer fees to to subsidize our policy work. So we all wanted to make bigger change, fundamental change in how housing works. Well, it turns out people were more interested in our policy work than our development. So we did a whole lot more policy work um, than we did development. Well, policy work can happen really quickly. Yeah, and development right. takes, you know, five years. That's a little bit of a so problem. So some of the things we did, if you ask anyone in L.A., any architect, uh, if they know the small lot ordinance, they all know it. Okay, we basically wrote that. So what we would do, we would work on policy, and then we would go to the L.A. planning, and where they would be promoting tran uh, housing along transit corridors, we went in and would show them, look, there's zero housing along your transit corridor, and they would go, your information's incorrect. And we go, well, that's funny. We got it all from your department, <laughs> you know? And they would ask us to draw a sketch and maybe write yeah. an ordinance or write a proposal, and then they would take it and actually turn it into policy. And they would send their proposed ordinance to us to review, so we said, let's just write our own. And so we wrote the small lot ordinance, the city adopted it. They put their own spin on it, but it's in place today. So it got a lot of press. And if you know anything about abundant, uh, el abundant housing. housing, they are the gold standard for, and even they're writing about it. Like, what's the, what is this small lot thing? Um, and so it has transformed. I'm just going to show you some of the projects that have been built under this ordinance. So Mark Rios, that was Lorcan O'Hurley, here's Barbara Bester. Everyone, all our friends are taking advantage of it. And, and these are parcels that had single family homes on them, single family houses. There's even a website now that tracks the development on the small lot ordinance. And even HUD follows us as the, what's the, one of the best practices for affordable housing development. But again, like I said, with all good things, we have planning departments and building departments. So they start, you know, taking it down, right? So we always thought policy, once you get it in policy, it's permanent. It's like our job's done, it's forever. And what we found out, it's maybe even more temporal than buildings. And the, the discussion was, are you gentrifying the neighborhoods and are you actually creating more of a problem? And the idea was really to make five houses where there was one, and that is more affordable and it's denser. So the affordable yeah. question is kind of a bigger, a bigger, I think, policy discussion. So we would go, we even, you know, again, part of it, what we want to do is a friend of mine told me, and I never realized it, it's like you guys are the only architects I know that if something doesn't work for you, you go, just go change the rule. <laughs> and I guess there's some truth to it, and our motive has been so we can do things differently, but it benefits a big, a greater population. 
Um, but like, so we go in with our own projects now under the small lot ordinance and the planner will tell us you can't do that. That's not and the I'll, intent of the Yeah, of the he'll ordinance. say, I'll go, why not? He goes, that's not the intent of the ordinance. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> you know? So they, you know, things get interpreted, things change, but we don't let it derail us. Um, so we moved on from that. It ran, Angie was the president of the board for a long time, and right when we kind of, this is our night job, you know, right when we got, got ourselves out of that, uh, we started talking and said, you know, we, I, what about this idea uh, about where we can make affordable housing better, similar to what they do with the Mayor's Institute? So we just wrote a grant to the NEA, and we got a grant. So, you know, now we had another night job that we just came off of. And we started this thing called the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute. And um, in, um, the idea was to bring, we pay to bring nonprofit developers, community groups to, to, into a three day institute. And we bring in architects, landscape architects, bankers, developers, just like we met. And we do a three day sort of charrette and help them with their projects. And we call that the resource team. And then that resource team helps them basically forever. And um, our idea is this was the first one we did in uh, 2010 in Minneapolis. It was supposed to be a one-time thing. We're now in our uh, like 14th year. We're going into our 14th year of it. And well, we had only funding for one, remember. <laughs> <laughs> but it, we got so much interest, it kept going. And then we basically, Enterprise Foundation, a colleague of ours, Katie Swenson, she was like, you know, my bosses at Enterprise really want to do this, like something like this. And we were like, you can have it. <laughs> and we handed the reins to them. And they've now taken it places where, that we never imagined they would go. Um, it's really pretty incredible. You can get, look at it online. All the information is free um, for there. But part of what we wanted to do was, um, like architects, this is how we see housing development. There's us down there, and then there's the developer. And that's it, you know, pretty simple thing. But this is what it really looks like. It's very complicated. And basically, most of the decisions, the design decisions, are made before we ever get involved. So really, what we wanted to do was to show that design matters. And so we created a whole series of things, starting with um, you know, the Design Matters Toolkit. Um, and our institutes, we publish them every year. And all this information is free online. You can go down, you can download it, everything's free. So what we try to do is make it easy for other developers to embrace this idea. So when we did the first institute, I remember, I won't say names, but it was a nonprofit group from, let's call it New York State, <laughs> uh, came to us with the worst, ugliest project I think I've ever seen. And I was like, there's no hope for this guy. You know, I almost wrote him off. And he completely drank the Kool-Aid. And, and his project is really quite beautiful. And tra he transformed what he, from what he was going to build. Now, this same person, he's not invited, you know, because we invite groups from around the country. But he shows up anyways. He comes to all the institutes anyways. So David Baker, that's one of his projects. So we produce things for those who are skeptical, like show how affordable housing improves neighborhoods and does better things. So believe it or not, we actually have a traditional practice as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and this particular project was one um, that is in the city of West Hollywood, and it's for um, a private developer and it's for sale units. Yeah, and what we did was what we always have is with budgets, 
every project has a budget, even when they're very generous budgets. And so we came up with this idea of a screen. And you know, we worked with a local manufacturer, C.R. Lawrence, and we made one screen and we put it over the whole building. And we did that because you know, this is an urban site. It's in West Hollywood. It's a lot line to lot line building. And what do you do when you have or your main orientations are west and east, right? It's a terrible orientation for sun. We wanted glass on the building. So this allowed us to have both shade also a porch, cross ventilation, and then people could actually open and close the shutters themselves. So this building actually changed. It was never kind of static, and it just changed based on how people used it. So it was ever changing when you go by, it always is different. Interestingly, the developer, you know, started looking at this and goes, hmm, you know, that's a lot of money for that facade. Um, you know, can we look at maybe removing it? And we yeah. said, sure, yeah, we can take it off. No problem. So we took it off and he looked at it and was like, God, it's really ugly, but you know, it <laughs> saves a lot of money. You but know? then when we gave it to our engineers, you know, the mechanical engineer said, well, we've got to add a lot of air conditioning now because like, you, yeah. you don't have any shade on the front of your building. And then the structural engineer said, well, if you're going to add all that equipment on the roof, we're going to have to upsize all the structure. And so when we got that, you know, bill. The developer thought we were a genius because he got this, all that the whole for, screen. for almost nothing. Like $40,000 for his entire building for this right. screen. So, so he we said, try, do it, go ahead, do we it. We try to do that. We try to not just do something for how it looks, but look at its performance and other things. And, you know, it speaks for itself. Because you really have to do both. Yeah, and it's a beautiful building. It, and the, this was actually built on the site where there was a famous music studio where David Bowie used to record. Frank Sinatra. And Frank Sinatra. So a lot of these, they're 2,000 square feet, these apartments have little sound studios in them. But same thing, natural light, cross ventilation, you're a winner. And we had a little fun in there. Uh, this, these are the kitchens. Those are uh, old skateboards we cut up and oh. made tiles out of us at the end of a hard day at work say I think I'm gonna go to my housing unit after work no one says that people say I'm going home and hopefully the residents who have the opportunity to be in a home of their own uh, leaving a life of homelessness behind, uh, hopefully they feel those same sorts of, of connections to what uh, a home represents. People are always a little worried um, about an affordable housing building going in or a, a supportive housing building going in. And I think all too often homeless folks who have passed through various systems probably reflect the worst in design. Um, this is the local welfare office, this is the local mental health office, this is the local probation office. Um, at best, pretty utilitarian. At worst, uh, spaces that communicate a very negative uh, message to the people who engage in those spaces. And we think that's a, a model that should be changed. Design can be used creatively uh, as a solution to ending homelessness, no matter where it exists. So this is a rectangular shaped building on a rectangular shaped lot. Nothing terribly unusual about it. Pretty commonplace actually when you think about it. But I think it, it says you can do something really imaginative and creative in, in terms of crafting that solution, even on a plain old apartment building lot. Angie mentioned that the facade of this building is actually a space, which is the first time I heard her describe it that way. And I thought, that is really pretty interesting. The facade is actually a space. This is a great looking building on this block, even without homeless folks in it. Uh, the fact that homeless people live here, I think, once again, promotes a very uh, positive depiction of what supportive housing can and should look like, in my opinion. 
I used to sneak in McDonald's and stuff, like I used to the restroom and go in there and take a bath. And my pride was really bad to just go and say I'm homeless. This building is marvelous. So I have family come visit. We have a community room. Like you won't guess, your guests don't have to be inside your home. They can be inside the guest room, enjoy your company for a couple of hours, and send them on their merry way. We created an aperture which was lifted up above the street so that it appears really open. There's a visual connection to the street, but not necessarily a physical connection. You can come up on the roof and just relax your brains and get your thoughts out and make yourself better. This building right here will make you a better person. In our tenants to be architectural critics. <laughs> We've got a little more work, but she's on the right path. So my, my career got started working for a nonprofit developer rather than um, an architect, and I'm a licensed architect, and Mike Alvedris used to sublease space from us, and he would come over to my desk and borrow that pencils. That was the guy in the video. He was the executive director of the Skid Row Housing Trust that was the owner of this building. And um, this building is called The Six, and it's for homeless veterans in Los Angeles. I think about 20% of our homeless population are veterans. And what we really wanted to do, because this is a neighborhood of very dense, defensive looking apartment buildings is to do a very dense building that appeared really open and inviting. Um, the building has a courtyard and one of the tricks that we kind of use to do this is when you raise your courtyard above, above the first floor, rather than making it really defensive with a guardrail, we use a stepped planter and we use a lot of green space to try to connect the courtyard to the street and that allows the building to look really open but it still has this kind of separate physical connection because the homeless people who live here um, were on the building committee that I had to present to. And we originally had some monumental stairs connecting the courtyard to the street. And they said, Angie, uh, we've been living on the street for a long time and the street's very dangerous and we don't even want to be connected to it any longer. So when you design your building, make sure we're not connected to the street. So this is what we did. And it's permanent supportive housing, which is a term that a lot of the developers use, which means that there are spaces here that actually help people improve their lives and become productive members of society. So the ground floor has a computer lab. Um, there, there are case managers here on site. But you can't see a fence, and you can't see a, uh, anything that people have to walk through, right? So it's a very secure building. You actually enter from the side yard and then kind of come up into the courtyard but it appears very open. The security is invisible. Um, and then so the open spaces are what I call these courtyards, I call them sort of the lungs of the building. And it tempers that kind of line between public space and private space. And so the courtyard becomes this place where people circulate and can be social. And a lot of these types of buildings have large social spaces. So this is a community room that opens onto the main courtyard. This is really the main social courtyard. And we work with the Marciano Foundation to put original artwork in there. So just because you're poor doesn't mean you have bad taste. The project manager who worked for the Skid Row Housing Trust, her brother's an artist, and so we got that connection, which is great. You can see the painting hanging outside. And Mike says that art heals pe these people who live in these buildings, and it really does. And so on the roof, we have also open space, but it's meant to be more zen-like and kind of private. Um, and this building is underneath the Pacific Flyway where birds act, migratory birds actually fly. So we wanted to put a lot of green space on the roof. Um, but people can choose what space they want to sort of be in. Um, and so the title of this lecture is Dense City. But you'll notice that a lot of our images have density on them. And I'm a really big proponent of density. So this building in particular, which is only a five-story building in downtown Santa Monica, um, is the density of Manhattan, New York, at about 267 units per acre. And it is for homeless people with mental disabilities in downtown Santa Monica. Um, one of the things that we try to do, because we have tight budgets and tight schedules on, on these buildings, is to take a s larger part of the budget and put it in a small area. So we do things that Larry actually coined the term mass customization, which is we take, uh, we took these aluminum panels and water jet cut them in one pattern. So all of these panels are the same actual pattern, 
we anodize them different colors and then we put them in different well, we orientations. Stacked, um, the sheets all together, big deep stack, and we told them make one cut. So at the end of the day, it didn't cost a lot of extra money, but this is the front of the building. It's a parcel that's 50 feet by 150. Um, it's called Step Up on Fifth, and there's an art studio down below. This is an image of the panels. The sun, the rising sun actually comes around, and these help mitigate the sun from those units. But the living units themselves are very small. They don't have ranges in them, so people actually share a kitchen. Um, and these smaller units are about 240 square feet each. But even at that size, we were able to get cross ventilation and a Murphy bed that flips out of the wall. So if you're homeless, would you rather have a, a unit like this or live on the sidewalk? Um, one of the tenants actually spoke to me about a year after we did this, and he said, Angie, I cried when I got the key to turn the door, the new, when, I got, when I knew it was my door and I could go into my unit, and he said, I slept on the floor for an entire year because he didn't feel safe enough to be able to sleep in his bed because he, he, he didn't think that it was really his and he had been living on the street for so long. Back 2011, I messed around and, and somehow in front of my grandmother's house, I got shot for no reason ever. She doesn't Compton though. I was at my grandmother's house, boom, got shot. I got on SSI. I got shot right here. I got shot right here, right here. And it came out at Brotman Hospital, they took it out. I had to see where like my mental health was and my body, you know, because um, it was bad, you know. I could not put my thought together for um, work. It just, it hurt, it hurt so bad. So I got on SSI and um, 2013 or 14, something like that, I ended up joining with Step Up. They help you fix your mind, you know, you gotta do it every day. 48 hours, you gotta do two days of thought processing. And uh, they help out with the uh, mental help of that disorder. I'm not gonna lie, this building is like the future or the futurism. Because I mean, every time you look around, you're like, wow, is that uh, decorative? You know, isn't that a, 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 a advisive? You know what I mean? It's just very, very nice too, and I love the uh, the, 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 the uh, skyscape or something like that. You can see he hasn't quite finished architectural critic school, <laughs> but we're working on him. And it's the letter E. It's an alphabet building like we used to build a hundred years ago. Two kitchens, two community rooms that people share, and this is the first tiny courtyard. We try to take things like exit stairs and make them into something special. And then courtyards. Um, these are all hi historic images of courtyards, and it's something that's really important to buildings and how people live. In Europe, there's a very, there's a much bigger differentiation between public and private. And I think in America, there's sort of public and then there's private. And so that line between public and private is tempered by the courtyard. But it's been an idea that's been around for a thousand years. It's a proven model. It works. Why not go with it? You know, so you'll we, find courtyards in most of our buildings. And so, these are letter E, letter U, you know, and if you go back a hundred years, that's how we used to build before we had air conditioning. Um, this project is on Skid Row for Michael Vidris, the Skid Row Housing Trust. And when he came to us, he said, I have two small buildings. I just need them renovated. There's no design. You know, do you guys really want it? So we said yes. And we discovered that the small courtyard this building had was really kind of the back trash hole, rooms. trash room. You know, this is actually the fire department access. So where they were thinking no design, we were thinking the opposite, even though they had no space. And these buildings are very dense. These buildings are about 500 units per acre because they're essentially hotel rooms and they're SROs, they share a kitchen on the ground floor. So we took the tiny courtyard that 60 people live here in this tiny building and we turned it into something special. Um, we, this is, these, those are bedroom windows that we put this slatted um, movable screen on and then these are benches that move back and forth in the courtyard and the fire department still accesses that space. That took a couple meetings with the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> and then this space is eight feet by 60 feet. Um, people actually used to throw trash out of their windows into this space because people just ignored it. And it was just you know, a space where people put trash. 
once you clean it up and make it a nice place that people actually want to use, no one throws trash in it any longer. And this is just an image of the, the kitchen. I actually think this is a type of housing that, you know, in South Korea, they have what's called the kitchenless house where everybody lives. You get, you know, a cheaper rent by living in a place like this. And this is for homeless people, but I don't know why we can't have this type of housing here for everyone. This is North Hollywood. And if you Google this area of North Hollywood, it'll tell you this is a very walkable, um, dense neighborhood with art and a lot of sort of legendary spaces like this bar here. Um, but our site was on this large freeway with like nothing around it. You know, that's the bottom. Right how do you side. kind of how do you make density in in something that's like this? So, but this is typically what happens. This is an affluent neighborhood <clears throat> that suffers for lack of restaurant workers. Um, and people that provide the services that we all like, and they come from Palmdale because they can't afford it. So this is a private development, and this is called inclusionary housing, and we think this is the model where it's mixed with you, you have affordable units, but you have market rate together. And that allows the developer, the city actually, if the developer does that, the developer is allowed to build a little bit taller and get a few incentives, and that makes it uh, worth it for the developer. So this particular building, this is showing you the courtyard. Um, it's almost 100 units per acre, and it's a mix, but you know you can't tell, right? Uh, the ground floor is retail. Um, someone t and there's an alley in the back, and someone said, well, Angie, why didn't you guys put all the units in front facing the street so everybody could have a street view? Well. If you put the units in back and make a sort of this portal frame in the front, more people actually have a view of the street. Um, we did the same thing by stepping the planter in the front so you don't see this sort of big fence and doesn't look defensive. But the courtyard is really the kind of the stage where everyone um, really lives and circulates through in this, in this building. Joe Giovannini told me, he said, it's kind of like buildings within buildings, like a little neighborhood. I like that description. I wish that was actually our concept, but we use it now. <laughs> and one thing that we really didn't realize until we built it and stood in the courtyard is you, the very noisy, busy street. All of the noise is really mitigated when you're standing in this courtyard. It's very, very quiet. Um, the views out of this portal are very beautiful, and everyone basically gets this amazing view when you're standing in the courtyard. So it's kind of a democratization also, I think, of kind of the city when you, when you design like this. Doing affordable housing does not just happen overnight. Rose Apartments is, first of all, the first ground up construction that has happened in Venice in over 20 years. The second thing is that Rose Apartments is 100% supportive, and that is a huge deal in the city of LA. Rose Apartments is gonna house 35 families. Half would be for families and individuals who are experiencing homelessness. There are folks in the community that don't want developments like this to happen. They have a lot of perception about unhoused people, you know, living on the street currently and how they transition into housing. They have a lot of negative thoughts and ideas of who are living in our buildings. And these things are just not, not true. We're excited to be able to give some unhoused folks that opportunity to, you know, live by the water and, and experience the beach. To, to have the same experiences as everyone else in Venice. Our client actually had their headquarters here, Venice Community Housing, and they were in small scale buildings and they were looking for a parcel in Venice and we live in Venice and the land prices are so high they couldn't afford anything. And I said, why don't you just build it here? You guys are here. So they moved out for a couple of years and we designed this project for them, which is 35 units for um, what we call transitional aged youth, Tay kids. So they have been, they've come out of the foster care system and a lot of them become homeless. And um, the executive director did a 50-50 where she took young homeless and adult homeless and combined them together. And it's been working really well, the model where um, the younger people and the older um, homeless people work together. <clears throat> but we just go down the street in Santa Monica and look at Irving Gill's Horatio Court built in 1919, still one of the greatest buildings. And we make 
the poor man's version of that, you know, the sort of hanging gardens of Venice. It's right across the street from Whole Foods. Everybody wanted it to be, you know, a beautiful neighborhood building. We wanted it to be a sculpture, but then we also had to design it for the people who live here. Um, we had, the, neighbor, the neighborhood didn't want it to be too tall, so we sunk the ground floor four feet, you know. Um, we stepped the, the planting so that the courtyard connects to the street, and it's a very tiny lot. It's about 84 feet by a little bit over 100, and the courtyard connects the second floor to the third floor. <clears throat> and you can see the building actually sparkles, you know, if you've been to the Hollywood Walk of Fame. We did that in the building. And um, so when you go by, people kind of stop because the building's like sparkling. Well, and if a when, fire truck goes by, it and becomes it turns pink. Red. It turns yeah. pink, <laughs> yeah. which is really cool. We didn't know that would happen, but it's a stucco building, so it's not an expensive building. You know, we we work with the materials and the budgets that we have and try to make something special. From the front, you don't see any windows either. It's meant to be really sculptural from the front, so everyone's windows are from the other sides. They either see a mountain view or an ocean view. And they have these great gardens. And, and everyone deserves a view. So this is a little extra space near the exit stair where people can stop and kind of see the view, everybody who lives here. They can see the mountains to the ocean from there. So they don't get the individual, but you can go out on the perch and have that view. Our neighborhood council unanimously voted not to build this, and then the planning commission unanimously voted for it. Now I have people coming to me saying, Angie, I don't know why we didn't vote for it. It's a beautiful <laughs> building, and you know, there's no problem with the people who live here. Um, we're working in Florida. We have a, an office in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and this is um, Emerald Isles? Normandy Isles. Normandy Isles. And you can throw a stone and hit Ivanka Trump's, or Ivanka Trump's house on the next island over, but they don't have enough affordable housing. So we're building some housing for seniors here. Uh, this is called the Heron. Um, and the challenge that we have in this community is sea level rise issues. So in the future, they're going to be rising this, raising the street three feet. Um, our ground floor has to be at least eight feet above the street. So how do you, how do you sort of connect the ground, the floor where everyone starts to live with that ground floor where it's essentially just parking and the street. And it uses a lot of the things, the MIMO in Miami Beach, the breeze block to provide shade and dappled light. This is a just starting construction. There are really great historic precedents in this, in this neighborhood and we had to go through the historic commission to get these approved. Um, this is called Vista Breeze and it's two different projects on two sides of the street. And again, it's the same thing where the courtyard is raised up on the, on the second floor, and how do you connect that, that back to the street? So we're using the green space to connect it and sort of step it down back to the street. And this one's about the break ground as well. Chicago. Yeah, this is you. Okay. Uh, just recently, literally within the last four weeks, we won this competition for pretty large housing uh, mixed-use housing in Chicago um, in Garfield Park, which is a neighborhood that's kind of been in a little bit of decline. So it's three buildings. It's about uh, almost 300 units right at a transit station. And uh, we're, we're working on the first project, which is this one. Um, you know, again, what we want to do is it, being right next to transit is so mm -hmm. important. But again, it has a courtyard. You know, it's like we plagiarize ourselves, but it's a good idea. It works. This is know? also in the park district, and we really wanted to kind of carry that park green space through the building. It's but across, it's, across the street from the hatchery, which is an incubator for kitchens, commercial kitchens, people who want to actually start restaurants. And ground floor is activated. You know, some have balconies, some, you know, this is again a mix income building. And again, those are what we think makes neighborhoods vibrant. So the sites don't have to be big either to do this. This is actually our office. This is a project we're doing at our office. Um, we're going to remodel our house, so we're going to have a place to move in while we do this. So we're going to add a little space to our office, but also make a place to live. That's our site. It's 10 feet wide. Um, <laughs> Yep. So we're doing what is a, a 
a sort of loft, two-story unit, expanding our office space, um, keeping our shop below. So it's on a super narrow footprint. We got a park right across the street. Amazing views. Our office is this one-story building below. Right, so this is what it's gonna look like when we're done. We have even a smaller site that we're working on too. Um, this is in North Hollywood. It's for the First Presbyterian Church. And like a lot of our clients, they, this is right by their church. And so they're trying to help homeless people. So they have this empty lot. That's a flag lot, which are super hard to build on. because It's the, empty for a reason. <laughs> yeah, because the fire truck has to use the whole lot to get to it. No one could ever build on it. And so we've come up with an idea. This will be a shelter for 30 homeless people. And they can kind of come and go as they please. So this is it. It's almost like a little spiritual uh, place. Whoops. And this is what the interior will look like with the skylight and then the beds that they move in and out from there. Few few years back, you know, uh, the city of L.A., most of you probably know this, we have a tremendous homeless problem. We have almost 70,000 people living on the street. And uh, the voters of L.A., have passed two propositions, and I forget what they're called. For billions of dollars. In, to Multi billions help. of dollars to do something about people living on the streets. And so we're kind of desperate. And so the county came out with this thing they called the Housing Innovation Challenge. So they're putting out about almost $5 million for someone to show them some innovative solution to the problem of homelessness. Now, this was really targeted for developers, but we said, we, we think we can do this. So we, we entered it and we won. Um, but our, our, first our first idea was, oh, just change your policy to right. allow bigger buildings, right? And the, they said, no, it has nothing to do with policy. You guys, whatever your design is, just work with an existing policy. So we came up with a really, what we call the Nest Toolkit. That's Angie's idea about the nesting habits of birds, where some are temporary, some are permanent. And this is meant for designers, so it is a kit. Um, and what's unique in LA, we have 29 cities within LA County, and 80% of the lots are those three sizes. So we took all the codes from all the cities, we analyzed them, and we came up with a building footprint and setbacks and everything that would fit within all those cities. Because and Los Angeles used to be a lot of single family homes, right? And those are the single family parcels. So the idea was to take the prefab home building industry, which was making single family homes, and tailor it to more multifamily housing. So this is a kit of parts that you can take, any developer can take those sites, they can configure it with our modules and come up with it. So, so this is just showing how it fits on many different kind of sites and at different densities. And then we left a, a lot of room for the designers to actually design it. So there's room to do your own facades, there's room to move the buildings, uh, make a courtyard a little bit bigger or smaller. And so it's really not our design, it's meant for people to pick it up and run with it. Right. So again, these are just some of the configurations and what things could look like. And our partners, Plant Prefab, I don't know if you said this, that. No, this is offered now by Plant Prefab. So when we complete, you should be able to go online at Plant, plug in your site information, say how many units, and use this configuration tool where it'll spit out a site plan, how many units, and the cost. And then they build it. So this is still, in progress, we have a number of projects we're actually doing right now using the toolkit. Uh, one of them we propose to the, the Mount Olive uh, um, Lutheran Church in Santa Monica. This is, you can see by the map, right by Santa Monica College. And there, this is another crisis that's happening. There are a lot of homeless students so kids, and the community colleges. kids that go to Santa Monica College are living in their cars. 
around campus. So the church has been going and gathering up the kids and they've been living at the church. So we said, why don't we do something, you know, and ha really house people because it's like a ragtag how they're doing it. And they said, we don't have any land. And we said, well, you got a giant- You have a parking lot. <laughs> giant parking lot. And they said, but we need our parking. Like you could see the parking lot there. We go, how about if we build it and you don't lose any parking? So we came up with this idea to build columns in the off hours, use our prefab product and put it over the parking. Now the problem was that lot is only zoned R1. It's a, only can do a single family house there. So we proposed a 15 bedroom house. With two kitchens. <laughs> two, kitchens two kitchens because we use the ADU. And we can do an ADU. So we have another <laughs> two bedroom ADU. So it's a 17 bedroom. 16 I think kit yeah. uh, college students. So there's the site. So we took the modules and made a space between and put a little roof on top. You know, the pastor calls it his little church up there. He loves the roof on there. So part of what we do is like, you know, over decades now we've heard there's a myth about who, who lives in affordable housing. And most of us think of it as the guy, you know, the drug person with needles out of their arm living on the street. That's the 1% of 1%. Most of them are fairly normal people that just had bad luck, you know, and we're very close to being in the same boat. You lose your job, you have a drink, and the next thing you know, half of the people we talk to say they don't even know how they got homeless, you know, and they worked as computer techs, they had jobs, they have kids and everything. So we said, you know what, why don't, let's try and do something uh, and make a show about it. But so we went to an art gallery and we proposed the show about housing and they said, are you nuts? So, you know, we came up with this idea to make it like art, right? So what we did was- In we, an art gallery. In an art gallery in Santa Monica, we made this huge, painting, but it, all that stuff has so much information in it about housing, and people come to this and think they're going to an art show, but what they're really doing is learning about housing. And so this is when you get close, what some of that, those things look like. Um, so we had incredible crowds there. Um, we compared the density of New York to the density of Los Angeles and why they're different and what that means in terms of the built form. They put us on TV. This is like about affordable housing. I mean, we had coverage. If you know anything about art, you know, this is the main, this is the mainstay of art publication. They covered our show, you know, so it's just kind of interesting. It's like how you look at it, what spin you put on it and how you tell the story can kind of change uh, the whole dialogue or the whole way in which we think about it. We've become a culture, We've that, become a culture that ignores people, ignores and, people looks the other way. and looks the other way. Our homeless problem, especially, homeless in, Los problem, Angeles, especially in Los Angeles, is so large is now so large that it's almost now, untenable. It's almost untenable. Los Angeles has the Los highest Angeles number of unsheltered people of unsheltered anywhere people. in the country, and clearly anywhere you can see that in Skid Row. There's a lot of suffering that goes on. If you're not ready to live in the streets, it gets pretty profound. It gets pretty profound. For those individuals who For have been largely isolated and alone, isolated. Beginning to try to build oh, solutions to over this, this can look at. I've known Mike for a long time, Mike, and this is really our first um, really collaboration. Our first, um, collaboration. The name of this project is the, the six project that we did for Mike, and that means that, that in military terms, that, it means I've got your back. Terms, it means I've got and really, back. Mike is and the really six Mike is for the six homeless people. for homeless people. I think I was one of the first people who, 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 who had keys, not the I thought I was dreaming. I came and looked, it was empty. Whose house is this? They said, yours. Yo, got a little radio, a microwave, radio, crop pot. Microwave, what, crop more pot. what more can you ask for? They have everything contained they in their own unit, but then they have my breath away. Because I've been suffering I've been for suffering a number of years. For a number of years. Suffering for years. Suffering for years. And, uh, 
And uh, what are you going to expect? What are you, you know? going to expect? Breaking you know? stereotypes of the Breaking homeless goes back to design. It, back says to design. it says it something. It says we care something. about you. It says we design, design definitely can empower the individual. If you ask Mike, he'll tell you that good design is part of the healing. A little bit like Frank Sinatra. If you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. No one has bigger homeless crisis than we do here in Skid Row. I think it's absolutely a replicable model. All you need is the will to do it. These are our cities. Whatever we make here, whatever buildings we build here, they're part of the larger fabric that defines our cities. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both, that was just super inspiring. Thank you, and I, I know there'll be questions, so if you're comfortable sure. with you. Yeah. And I, just to remind people, I will come <laughs> with a microphone, and so they can pick it up on the video when you talk. Is there any questions from? Right over there. Oh. I have a question about parking. <laughs> um, I, I only started sort of paying attention to that piece midway through, and I did see one, the mixed-use building, or the mixed-income building that had parking. Mm -hmm. um, but with this kit of parts that you've developed for 80% of the lots, is there parking in that model? Uh, no, on that particular one. But parking, uh, you know, the, it's different depending on where you are in urban situations. The, you, you, um, you can rely a lot less on it. Um, but I can tell you the projects that are the affordable projects, they, nobody parks there. Okay, so we generally have parking in all of them, but to give you an idea, the uh, project, the Rose Avenue project has 35 units and we have 17 parking spaces. And it's empty, the parking garage. Okay, the city, that other step up one we did, we were forced to put in a subterranean parking, even though we were exempt from it, the parking structure cost one almost point, one and a half million dollars that and no one parks there. And actually, the nonprofit developer cannot lease the parking to anybody else in downtown Santa Monica because of the tax, the historic tax credits that he got. So it's a crazy world we live in um, when we actually give space to a car and the car doesn't even park there any longer. <laughs> so it depends on the situation. Any other questions? Uh, Brian? Okay. <laughs> um, here in Monterey County, um, our general plan rules the day, and then our Monterey County general plan, and a subset of that is the Carmel Valley Master Plan, which is, again, another ruling set of, of rules. But the Carmel Valley Master Plan covers a piece of property bigger than San Francisco bigger than San Francisco. So what did they approve, the Carmel Valley Master Plan? They approved it for, I think it was originally about 260 units for property bigger than San Francisco. Then the Carmel Valley Master, Carmel Valley Association sued. That was too many houses. And they got that reduced to 190 homes for, again, a property bigger than San Francisco. So I hired an attorney, sent him to Sacramento mm -hmm. to complain, saying that was prejudicial against right. the elder, against everybody. Right. So what? They passed it. So if you try to build anything in Carmel Valley, which I did, I applied to do a project with affordable housing, met all the regulations, and they turned it down. So I sued. Mm -hmm. So they settled, and they said, okay, reapply. Your lawsuit is still active. We settled, so I reapplied. They turned me down again. <laughs> and they said, okay, oh, you no. could resurrect your lawsuit. So they said, what, well, the attorneys, why do you keep suing? They're just gonna keep moving the goalposts. So then after Governor Newsom did the SB 35 and did the by right, mm -hmm. so I applied then by right, because in about 10 years, they had done no affordable housing. None, mm -hmm. zero, right. zip, nada. So I looked in back 10 years at all the planning meetings, I went in by right and applied. So in 90 days, if they didn't approve it, my by right would be approved. Build a remedy. And then on the 
one day on the 89th day, they called Sacramento and said, what is this regulation? And they told them. And they said, well, because Monterey meets the affordable housing that they didn't have to do by right, my project, because they met one, one leg of the, one leg of the, of the triumphant. They didn't do any, anything to do with affordable, but they did meet market rate housing, so therefore they didn't have to give me by right to do the project. So three times I've been turned down, so the county gives lip service, so in terms of architects or the architectural community, the, and what I see from you is you're changing at the policy level by the architects being heavily mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. So at every meeting that all of these issues that are going on, I've never seen our architectural community rise to the occasion at the general plan meetings or right. at the policy meetings. So I think for us, we would need your help in having an air chapter try to affect policy changes. Right. Because even with Newsom, we can't get it done. Right. Yeah, and that's what it, it takes the most intestinal fortitude, the policy part. But when you change it, you change it for everyone. And every community is different. So we're not an advocate of just building everywhere. You got like an incredibly beautiful place. It shouldn't be, you know, the Wild West here. You do, we're big on conserving nature too, but you have to have a mix. Cute communities are more vibrant when they have a spectrum of uh, people from wealthy to poor because they all, it's interconnected. And we really, believe it or not, work as a unit even though we might not like people or certain kinds of people. And I, I really think architects are the ones who are gonna be solving the problems that we're gonna have in the future. And we're the ones who can show people what the links are between the policy over here and what the built environment looks like over here and who can live there. No one else can do that. It's only architects. And because of our past work, I was asked to be on the, this is the housing element you're talking about for the future of cities and, and their affordable affordability, so I was asked to be on the city of West Hollywood's housing element task force, and I was the only architect. And I'm sitting on this, this group of people who are all really smart, but none of them are architects, and none of them really understand that you can have the same building in West Hollywood, looks exactly the same. If you're in Los Angeles, you can put 20 units in it. If you're in West Hollywood, you can only put 10 units in it, based on their zoning code. So there's no one else who understands that except an architect, and so that was, so I was helping them change their policy without doing too much work to allow more dense affordable housing to be built. And I really think it's our profession that can do that. And we just haven't really been asked to be at the table. We need to really get ourselves you know, to the table. The city ultimately didn't go with that. So Angie reported them so to the So I wrote a letter to the <laughs> HCD. Yeah, and because their housing element got rejected and um, and they said, well, there have been two letters written about this. One was Abundant Housing LA that said, you know, your report was incorrect or didn't meet the standards. And the other one was from Angie Brooks, you know. And I felt like <laughs> I was working with the planners of the city of West Hollywood, who I consider to be my colleagues. And I think it's become so political now that they actually said to me, Angie, we don't feel comfortable speaking in public about this. Can you come to the Planning Commission and speak in public and explain your ideas to the Planning Commission? So the planners didn't want to do that. People they wanted me to do it in public, so afraid. I did that on a Zoom call, but it's like, why can't the planners do that? So. Have you found very much changes in your practice or how it works with the new laws that have come down from the state in the recent years? Yeah, mm -hmm. big changes. But we're, uh, you know, I remember not too long ago, we would, it was very hard for us to muster up enough to show for 40 minutes. You know, now we have to work really hard to keep it with that. So you're only seeing a small tidbit of what we do. We have a, a whole array of other things that are happening, you know, but. We would need four hours. Yeah. <laughs> the things in housing I know. So, yeah, so. we do museums and, you know, other high-end houses. We kind of, we do, we'll do a dog house if you let us do it well. I think you have, we did a bird house just recently. Yeah, we did a bird house. <laughs> Any other questions? I think there was one back here.
Thanks so much for the work that you do. Um, I have a background in public health, and so this is wonderful to see. I was and wondering, it's connected um, to that, too. Yes, it is, yeah. absolutely. Yep. Um, so you're working in some rough neighborhoods, and I was wondering um, if what you do in the design that's maybe intentional to keep uh, the property safe and to prevent crime, and that um, I was also wondering, is there any resident involvement in um, maintaining the, the safety and keeping the property thriving? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what we've shown you is housing that has kind of supportive services with it, embedded with it. So there's always a, a manager on site. The people who live there are all, uh, you know, they all take pride in kind of where they're living. And then also, I'm finding now that I actually talk to building committees that are made up of people who were previously homeless. And in, in my lifetime, that's, I mean, that's pretty, pretty new. new, you know? Um, um, and you know the interesting thing is if you if you talk to homeless people who've lived on the streets, they know more about city streets than the city street people do. Bureau of Engineering. They can tell you which streets are busy, which streets are dangerous, which streets have crime, where the drugs are being dealt. They can tell you all this stuff. And do we ask a homeless person ever about that? You know, no, we don't. So, um, so and you know what we try to do too is you know we look around cities and we see these big fences, big eight foot fence in front of a project, and that's not. How, that isn't inviting to anyone, and it's anti-people, I think. So mm. our projects are totally secure, but we put the fences, we recess the fences in kind of the secure area back. Most of them have cameras that you can't see. Um, I think defensible space is something that we think about a lot, where there are always eyes on these spaces. They're always like, and to me, it's too much light. We walk by this project that we showed, which is in our neighborhood, and there's at night, it's like a Christmas tree, and I think, well, there's too much light on. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of light on for safety. Well, it's a struggle, honestly, with some of it. We do design for those things, but what we try to pay attention to is, like, to give you an example, you know, we do this beautiful project, and then here they come with the dangerous chemical sign, and they want to put it right on the front door. You know, and I have to say, you know, and the, the people who run, you know, the nonprofits, they go, well, we have to have it. I go, would you put that sign on your front door? You know, then why does it work here? You know, that's like you have people, I don't care where they come from, want to be treated with dignity. You know, don't put a dangerous chemical sign at the front door. Okay, yes, it needs to be posted, but put it in the closet, you know, for Christ's sakes or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's little things that we try to make it like a home, and that's the, the, the biggest thing I think we try to do, and not like an institution. Thank you guys so much for the talk. It was so nice to hear from you. Um, it seems like you guys are really integrated into Los Angeles. You guys live there, and a lot of the projects you showed are from there. What was it like working in, I think Chicago was one of the projects. Um, yeah. Did you learn any lessons, or how is that different? Well, we're, you know, California is a bit unique. At least everyone in the world thinks that. So, like, if you're from... California it doesn't apply to anywhere else in the world. We get that all no the time. No one from New York will hire us. Yeah, no, they're kidding. like, well, that works in California. <laughs> you know, so we're constantly, it, at all the accolades we've gotten, we still have to prove ourselves every time we go somewhere else. So we, we have projects around the globe in the Middle East and Mexico. We've done some in Charlotte, North China. Carolina. We always work with another architect who's local. That's so kind of the key. We're, we're an office of 30-ish people, but we work every, almost all of our projects are with other architects. And we have eight people in Florida in an office in Florida. Yeah. So we, if sometimes people visit our office and they look at what we're doing there, look around, they go, how are you doing all that work? And I'm like, I started to question it myself. <laughs> you know, how are we doing that work? You know, well, it turns out we, we're working with other designers. So when we go to Mexico, we don't act like we know everything. Even if, you know, we, we Chicago small projects, we still work with local people. 
and we wor always work with people that have knowledge and we, we try not to think we know everything. Uh, but if we were doing all of it, we'd probably be 60 people or so. Yep. So yes, you learn when you go to different places, but, but it we doesn't don't know. preclude we don't know everything, you so. from being able to work in different places. Yes. That's, I'm sorry, Karen. I was just going to add, your projects seem very suited to their place, and you're working all over the different countries, yeah. different locations. How does context, how does that work into your design process? Because it seems very obvious from the products you're producing that they're coming from that. <clears throat> yeah, we, and we do look at that. You know, there are different factors in cold climates. They're very different than you know, here where it's, we got the best weather on the planet. You know? No one would allow us to do brick in L.A. You're right. <laughs> we're, you so know, the, Chicago. The, it's actually kind of refreshing and fun because here, you know, you can more or less build out of cellophane, you know, and, and it's good. You go to Chicago, you got to build the real building. So we get to work with brick yeah. and we get to work terracotta, with... Terracotta, you know, our clients you know, are saying, can we use terracotta? Yeah, yeah we get please, to work with let's stuff do that. We never get no to work stucco. with here. You yeah. know, and the Miami project seemed very Miami. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's all concrete block. You yeah, know? it's concrete. You know, there's not a drop of wood anywhere in right. sight. So the materiality right. has a lot to do with yeah, it. Yeah, has a lot to do with it, and you can't yeah. use. And what's available locally? Mm -hmm. You can't use certain things, so it helps. As if you understand that, it kind of sorts itself out. And it's not really rocket science at the end of the day. You know, with waterproofing and climate and regional you know, things, you know, you just have to know about it and address it in the way that you need to for that region. Karen? Well, thank you very much. I have about 10 questions, but <laughs> I'll try to confine it. Um, some of the buildings you showed us are obviously people who were formerly homeless. Um, do you see them, once they have a safe place to live and sleep, being able to get their lives together to get jobs and, and uh, mm -hmm. move Yeah, up? a lot of them do, but a lot of yep. them, it's like, you know, if you're an alcoholic, it's a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't really cure it, you learn to live with it, so to speak. You know? Yeah, so, and it really depends on the tenant population and demographics, you know, and if, um, if it's a population that has mental disabilities or substance abuse or physical disabilities or people who are just poor and need a, and need a place to live a step up, you know, <clears throat> then, then they can work, you know, in the neighborhood. Um, step Up on Fifth, the project that we showed, has a commercial kitchen where they actually hire people who were previously homeless to work in a kitchen environment and they train them to cater parties for other people. So we've had them come and cater parties at our house. Big donor, um, museum donor people, and their homeless people cater. Who are who have been trained to cater, yeah. and then they they make the best brownies. Too. And they have, <laughs> and so they can then it's a step up for them, and they then get a job and kind of can move on. But it's that's definitely a part of it. Yeah, that was one of the questions too. Is um, there are so many requirements money, uh, that you can only make so much money mm -hmm. to be in Correct. certain mm -hmm. units. And then if you happen to get a better job and then you have to leave you that don't. No, most no. of our so clients will not kick people out. If They go I, voluntarily. But I'm actually not sure if that's like a state law or if it's just the nonprofit. But they don't um, evict people if they make more money. So Community Corporation of Santa Monica, if you live there and you get more money, you, you can stay there. You raise yourself up, they will not evict you. You can stay there. Okay, you know, that's, you, can, that's... you move on mm -hmm. as you're but comfortable moving on. But you're right. If, we, if they were to evict someone in Santa Monica, they wouldn't be able to afford you know, <laughs> living anywhere else, probably. Okay, so then you had some uh, that were mixed units, so mm -hmm. that you had some that were Set market aside. rate as well as... How, do, how does that work out? Do you follow it after you build the building and do you come back and say, how's this working? It's regulated, you know, but some of the biggest developers in the country, for example, Related, you may have heard of them, Forest City, they started in Section 8 housing and some of the big high rises with, you know, $100 million condominiums also have affordable housing in them. 
You just and those are it. private developers. And um, Forest City said they do an 80-20, where it's 20% affordable, 80% market rate, because <laughs> they feel like it makes their communities better by providing that element of affordability. And um, I haven't heard, we haven't really necessarily tracked those particular units, but it's because people are people, right? And, and if you, you either have money or you don't, and it doesn't mean you're necessarily an alien or some other type of person, so there's no problem necessarily with them. But I also would say that, you know, at one time we had hospitals or places for people to live who had me mental disabilities, and we no longer have that. So you can have adults who have mental disabilities if they're your child or whoever they are, and you, you, there's no place for them to go. We have, we have people who have a lot of money that lives in, live in our projects that are more problems than the people that don't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. You know, the people never complain, the poor people about their faucets leaking, you know, and things. So it's, they, there's a mechanism for tracking that. We as designers, you know, we do to the extent that we want to know how it affects what we do, but we don't get into the nuts and bolts of that. I think one more, maybe. The people are looking like they're tiring here. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. As a current architecture student, um, this has been very inspiring. So thank you guys. Um, I'm curious. You guys were talking about how you guys are the catalyst in many situations in lower economic communities to kind of start growth. I'm curious how in the design phase of things you guys are planning for community development in the future. Uh, I don't know that we are. Is that kind of yeah. out of the scope? Well, no, it's, I mean, we... The design phase of a, of a building doesn't necessarily, maybe I don't understand your question. Um, I think we're always thinking about communities, and I, I tell people I'm a frustrated urban planner, because when I went to architecture school, I thought that, I was designing utopias in school, designing communities, and then I got out of school, and I was given a closet of... to, so to <laughs> Cyark and was accused of doing a Berkeley thesis at Sire. But I worked on um, Dick and Lily Zanuck in LA, who had a lot of money, were doing this big house. I worked on the inside of their house for an entire summer, her closet. Carving moldings. Carving custom mold, or drawing yeah, yeah. custom moldings. And I, did, and I realized that that wasn't what I wanted to do the rest of my life. I actually wanted to make communities better, but there was nowhere for me to go. So that's when I went to a development, a nonprofit developer, and they weren't hiring at the time. So I went, knocked on their door, I kind of uh, barged in and worked for about a week volunteering and then someone left and they said, oh, I guess we'll hire Angie now. <laughs> and they hired me and then I stayed there for three years and I learned a lot about development and I realized that no one who was actually developing had my experience. No, you know, they were making these huge decisions about communities. Where are we gonna put this building? Um, they were talking to council members. They were no doing- No design input. And they had no idea how to design communities. So I think it's a part of the education of an architect, too, in our profession. And I think we kind of need to break open our profession, kind of the way the law profession did many years ago, where you, we want people to walk around mayors of cities and say, where's my architect? Instead of, where's my attorney? Where's my architect? I have a big decision I have to make next week. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you both so thank much. There's, there's more wine <laughs> at the back and some water. And please be here on May 18th, Thursday, for our, our final discussion of the, of the series. Thank you.